Hi, my name is Jason Moore. I'm chair of the Department of Computational Biomedicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And today I'm going to tell you about our work on automated machine learning for the study of Alzheimer's disease. I very much see Alzheimer disease and brain health in general as a complex system. And what I mean by that is that we have many components shown down here at the bottom. Think of these as genes, environmental factors, other, other biomarkers. Um, these biomarkers, these components, organize themselves into subsystems, shown here in the ovals, and subsystems organize themselves into what are called control structures. Think of a control structure as a biochemical pathway, for example. Multiple pathways interact to form a system, and the system gives rise to a health outcome, such as Alzheimer's disease. And the key point of this slide is to say um, that it's very difficult to predict the behavior of a complex system or the output of a complex system from just knowledge of the individual components. You need to understand how these components interact in time and space um, to produce the behavior of the system. And it turns out this is uh, a very difficult uh, process. We live in a big data world, combining big data, uh, diverse data with uh, a complex system such as brain health necessitates artificial intelligence methods. And this is gonna be the focus of my talk today. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about machine learning, which are the algorithms that we use to find patterns and data that we can use to do things like predict uh, health outcomes. Now, machine learning is very hard, even for experts. And one of the challenges is that each machine learning algorithm looks at data sets in a different way. This slide shows three different data sets with an X and a Y variable and two outcomes, red and blue. Think of those as perhaps cases and controls. And so what machine learning is trying to do is find a mathematical function of the X and Y variables, in this case, that discriminates or predicts the red versus the blue. And what you can see is that each machine learning algorithm is looking at the data in a very different way. And the performance shown here in the numbers, think of this as predictive accuracy, the performance is different uh, for each different machine learning method and some methods work better on certain data sets. And so this is one of the big challenges is how do you know what the right machine learning algorithm is to choose when you start a machine learning analysis? This is a study we did a few years ago and published um, on more than 150 different uh, uh, data sets, uh, applying, doing a very comprehensive analysis across many different machine learning methods and parameter settings. And what we found is that for some data sets, all the methods did well, but for other data sets, only certain methods did well. So there's tremendous variability in the performance of, of machine learning algorithms and no one machine learning algorithm um, was ideal for um, every data set. In fact, what we found was even the simplest methods, such as naive Bayes, performed optimally on certain data sets. And so what we think of as powerful methods like gradient tree boosting um, or random forest or support vector machines um, might perform well much of the time, but they don't always perform the best. And so again, this is one of the challenges is how do you know what the best method is for your particular data set? And not only that, every method comes with a whole host of parameter settings that you have to set. And even before you get to the machine learning shown here in green, you might wanna do feature selection shown in red. There are dozens of different feature selection methods to select a subset of variables. Uh, you might wanna do feature engineering. You might wanna recode or combine the features before you do the analysis using things like principal components analysis. And you might wanna normalize the features doing um, things like uh, uh, a Gaussian normalization. Um, and there are dozens of different um, feature transformation methods. And so at each step in building a machine learning pipeline, there's lots of decisions to be made and those decisions can have a big impact on uh, the results. And even once you find a pipeline that you think is performing well, that generalizes, that's just the beginning of actually turning the machine learning pipeline into something that's useful. In other words, deploying it to the clinic, for example. You need to interpret uh, the results. You need to validate it. You need to be able to explain the results to clinicians so they trust the results and they understand what the method is doing and what the results mean. Um, you need to be able to communicate those results uh, to patients, for example. 
Uh, you need to make sure that your algorithm is fair and unbiased. Uh, and then you have to build, if you want clinicians to use it, you have to build decision support tools uh, that don't interfere with their clinical workflow flows. So lots of work, lots of decision goes into not only building a machine learning algorithm pipeline, but deploying it. And so the goal of my research program over the last um, uh, eight to 10 years has been to make machine learning easy and accessible and to take some of the guesswork out of all of these decisions that need to be made. Now in 2015, I hired a, a brilliant postdoc na named Randy Olson. Um, he would, had just finished a PhD in computer science uh, at Michigan State University. And I met Randy at a computer science conference and saw him give a talk and was very impressed. So I went and talked to him and convinced him to come do a postdoc with me. And the summer of 2015, uh, Randy and I were whiteboarding, brainstorming ideas, and he came up with this idea of automating machine learning. Um, and so we um, spent some time sketching out how this might work, and he did all the coding. And six months later, we had an automated machine learning algorithm that we called Teapot, the tree-based pipeline optimization tool. Um, and what Teapot does is it automatically builds an entire machine learning pipeline using all the various components that I've just described. So we wrote this up and sent it to a, an artificial intelligence conference, um, and um, it was well received. It won a best paper award that, that year. Um, this was published in July of 2016. And this paper is now uh, being cited more than 100 times a year, and it turns out um, that it was one of the very first in the world automated machine learning methods. And just to, to uh, demonstrate that, Google announced its very first automated machine learning method and software in July of 2018. So more than two years after we released uh, Teapot uh, to the world. So I'm very proud of this. Um, you don't get to say that you're two years ahead of Google very often, um, but turns out we were on the bleeding edge of, of um, a brand new discipline called automated machine learning. So I don't have time um, to go into Teapot in a lot of detail, um, but here's a high level summary of, of the components of the Teapot algorithm. So the first thing we needed was a machine learning code base. And fortunately there's a, a very popular and, and widely used open source Python package called scikit-learn, which is very comprehensive, has tons of different machine learning algorithms and feature selectors and feature engineering algorithms, et cetera. Um, and so, and this is probably the most widely used machine learning library uh, out there. Um, so we adopted this and this formed the code base of Teapot. The next thing we needed was a way for the computer to represent pipelines, machine learning pipelines, to piece together the, the different operators. And we use expression trees, which is a, a type of data structure um, in computer science. I'll show you this in a minute. And then we needed an optimization algorithm, and we picked uh, genetic programming because it's a very effective um, optimization and search algorithm for working with expression trees. And then of course we needed to worry about overfitting um, as we're evaluating lots of different machine learning algorithms on a particular data set. So we do cross validation, but we also do something called Pareto optimization or multi-objective optimization. And we balance the complexity of the pipeline with its predictive performance. So here's an example expression tree that Teapot could generate um, representing a machine learning pipeline. Here you have a support vector machine at the root node of the expression tree with its parameters. Um, you have an operator here that combines features. And in this case, um, there's two different feature selectors being applied to the data set. Um, so each one of these operators selects a subset, those features get combined, and then a support vector machine is doing the final prediction. So one of the great things about Teapot is it can build pipelines of any shape, any combination, um, thus making it very flexible. Um, and Teapot can explore a wide range of pipelines that you would, as a human, never think to, uh, to develop and try. So this is a recent um, evaluation of Teapot that we did using a synthetic data benchmark set that we developed. And what we did in this particular study is, is use AI to develop uh, mathematical models for simulating data such that the simulated data 
produces a wide variety of re results across different machine learning algorithms. So the AI is optimizing the functions to produce this desired result. In other words, we wanted a set of synthetic benchmarks um, that maximize the diversity of performance across different machine learning algorithms. And our thinking is that this will provide an ideal test bed for any new machine learning algorithm. Um, and we generated 40 such bench benchmarks um, and, um, and, and each benchmark has a, a different ranking of the different machine learning algorithms, a different best, a different worst algorithm. And you can see here in this heat map, the performance uh, diversity of uh, the different methods across the 40 data sets. Um, this paper, uh, the, the resource itself is on GitHub shown here at the bottom. Uh, we have a paper on archive uh, describing um, the resource. And we just had a paper accepted in Science Advances and this will be published very soon. So here is the performance of different machine learning algorithms, Teapot, and a, another commonly used automated machine learning method across the 40 data sets shown here in the box plots. These are area under the ROC curve. Um, and you can see that Teapot and Autosklearn, another competing method, performed quite well um, on across these 40 benchmark data sets, whereas any other one machine learning algorithm had quite a, a diversity of performance across the 40 data sets. I'm sure each of these methods did well on certain data sets. Like you can see here for logistic regression, it did well on two data sets, but overall it did poorly on the others. Gradient boosting uh, and XG boost um, did fairly well across the data sets, but not as well as the automated machine learning methods. So this um, convinced us that Teapot and automated machine learning um, is a better way to go because it, it can automatically find the right and tune the right machine learning method for your particular data set. And we're developing a paper um, that we'll, we hope to submit in the coming month or two for this. One of the first things we did with Teapot was to start thinking about how we could scale it to big data in, in biomedical research. Um, we published this paper a few years ago. Um, this is work done by my postdoc, Trang Lee on scaling um, Teapot to big data, genomics scale data. And we did that in two different ways. First, we developed a feature set selector, which is an operator in the Teapot pipeline that can select a subset of features based on biological knowledge. And we created a template where you could provide a template for what you want pipelines to look, at, look like. So if you just want a feature transformer and a machine learning method, you can tell Teapot to iterate over that, that particular type of structure. And that can speed up Teapot quite a bit. This is a paper we published recently um, applying Teapot to a genome-wide association study for coronary artery disease. And what we did in this study was we used knowledge about the druggability of coronary artery disease genes to focus the analysis and gave that information to Teapot so we could um, do a more efficient analysis. So not only did this make the analysis more efficient, but also made the results more directly applicable to drug development. And this is an example of the best pipeline that was found in this large GWAS study for CAD. Um, and let me just step you through this. So you can get an example, get a, a better feeling of the kind of pipelines that Teapot is developing for real data sets. So here, Teapot included two feature selection algorithms shown in red, a percentile selector. Um, so the features here are SNPs coded 0, 1, 2, and it's selecting a, a certain percentile. So um, kind of a frequency-based selector. Think of it as a genotype frequency selector. So it's starting with all the features, um, all the SNPs, and then picking a subset. Okay, so that subset then gets passed to the next one, and it does a variance threshold selector, which is another type of genotype frequency selector, selects a subset. That selector goes to a feature engineering algorithm uh, called a, stoch a stochastic gradient descent classifier. So what this is doing is using a machine learning algorithm uh, to make predictions, but then taking the output of that and creating a new feature, Z1. 
this new constructed feature, the output of the machine learning algorithm is put back in the data set. Another round of feature selection is done using a machine learning algorithm called an extra trees classifier. And based on the feature importance scores, it's picking the best features and then feeding that to an extra trees classifier to do a final round of prediction of no coronary artery disease versus coronary artery disease. Now, two key points here. First of all, Teapot did this completely without human intervention other than the drugability information that we gave it. So it did it in a completely automated fashion. And secondly, no human would ever build in a million years a pipeline that looks exactly like this. And so this is the real power of Teapot, to do the kinds of things that you as a human would never do and find those better performing machine learning pipelines. Okay, I wanna switch gears now um, and tell you about a new project um, to develop automated machine learning methods um, for uh, the analysis of multimodal data in Alzheimer disease. Um, and so this is a U01 that was recently funded by the National Institute of Aging. And through the award of this grant, we were brought into the Alzheimer disease sequencing project consortium and specifically a consortium of um, PIs and grants uh, funded to develop AI and machine learning methods for Alzheimer's disease. So we're really excited to be part of this consortium uh, and to have this funding. Uh, my my co-PIs are Marilyn Ritchie and Lee Shen from the University of Pennsylvania. And each of us has a project in this grant um, looking at different aspects of multimodal data analysis, all using automated machine learning methods. Um, okay, so... Um, I uh, wrote this editorial, published this editorial earlier this year on the human side of artificial intelligence and make the point in this piece published in Extreme Tech Magazine about the importance of humans being involved in, in the AI process. In other words, we don't want to just give an AI a GWAS data set, let it figure it out and be done. There's um, a, a lot of different roles for the human in the entire process of doing the machine learning, doing the AI analysis. And I go step through those in this piece. But one of them that I mentioned is the important role of expert knowledge, that we as humans have a lot of biological knowledge about genes and drugs and Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. And why should an AI be ignorant of all of that knowledge? We as humans talk to each other. We exchange knowledge. We learn from the knowledge that's in the literature. We learn from the knowledge at conferences like this one. Uh, why should an AI be naive to all of that knowledge? And so that's really the focus of my piece of this grant is how do we use expert knowledge to guide automated machine learning algorithms? And how do we do that in a completely automated way? So the first thing we needed to do um, to get this project started was develop an Alzheimer disease knowledge base. And this is work done by my postdoc, Joe Romano, a uh, very talented individual who um, is joining the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania very soon as an assistant professor. Um, and uh, he had created in my lab um, a knowledge base called CompTOX AI for computational toxicology projects. And what we did was adapted that here to Alzheimer disease. So this, this knowledge base includes more than 20 different sources of knowledge. This is one of the most comprehensive knowledge bases for Alzheimer's disease out there. This includes things like gene ontology, keg pathways. It includes things like drug bank for information about drugs. It includes knowledge sources about diseases and symptoms, um, et cetera. And I'll, I'll dive into this in a little more detail on the next slide. And again, another thing that sets this knowledge base apart is what Joe did was create a, a biomedical ontology for integrating these different knowledge sources. And what an ontology gives you is the semantic relationships. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, and so that's another thing that makes this sets this knowledge base apart from many others is that we do have an ontology. We do capture the semantic relationships. And then we put that into a special database called a graph database, and we use Neo4j for that, so that we have all the entities, drugs, genes, diseases, symptoms, um, et cetera. They're all captured in a graph-like structure in a database, and we understand the semantic relationships between all the entities using the ontology. 
And this is what we call ALSKB, and we focus specifically in this knowledge base on drugs and genes and other things that are connected to Alzheimer's disease as a phenotype. And you can get to um, this database. It's publicly available now at ALSKB.ai. So here's an example of some of the entities that we include in our knowledge base, um, drug, disease, body part, symptom, uh, pathway, um, biological function, et cetera. And you can see here the semantic relationship. So for example, a drug can belong to a drug class, a drug can treat a disease, a drug can cause an effect um, of a disease, a drug can bind to a gene, um, a uh, body part can be under the expression of a particular gene. So not only do we have all these entities captured in the knowledge base uh, and the knowledge graph, but we have information about their relationships. And just as an example, here is a portion of the network for drugs and genes that both connect uh, to Alzheimer's disease and to each other. So here are known Alzheimer drugs. Some of these are probably look familiar to you. Um, and these are all drugs used to treat Alzheimer's disease. And here are the genes that bind, um, uh, for which those drugs bind to, like CYP2D6. Uh, so a lot of drug metabolism genes. And these are genes that are associated uh, in GWAS, for example, with Alzheimer's disease. So the knowledge graph we can do a, construct a query like this of the knowledge graph very quickly. We can return the results. We can see the relationships and the ideas that we hope that this can inform our machine learning analysis. And we're preparing a paper right now describing this resource and um, how it was built and the um, real world example I'm gonna show you here in a second. Uh, hope to get that submitted here in the next few weeks. So we wanted a demonstration project for the knowledge base. And um, what we decided on was to consider the relationship between Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. And of course, PD and AD have some overlapping features, some clinical and pathologic features. And there, and there's a um, this paper, for example, that was just published a few months ago, um, speculates that knowledge of Parkinson's disease might reveal some new genes for Alzheimer's disease. So we took this on as a demonstration project for our knowledge base to see if it could be used to make inferences about PD genes that might be related to AD. So here's what we did. We started with AD and PD as our phenotypes um, from the knowledge base. We identified genes that are uh, associated with AD or PD exclusively. Uh, and then what we did was um, we wanted to build a framework for predicting PD genes that might be related to AD. And the way we did that is we treated the uh, Alzheimer's disease genes. Uh, there were 101. Um, most of these have support from GWAS as cases. Um, these have direct connections to AD in our knowledge base. And then we identified a set of genes that are two or three steps removed from Alzheimer's disease in the graph. Now, of course, there are thousands of those genes, but we selected a, a random subset of 303, uh, three times as many controls as cases here for our analysis. So these are genes not related to Alzheimer's in our knowledge graph. These are genes related to, to, to Alzheimer's disease. And then what we did was we constructed features from the properties of the graph. In other words, we, we looked at a number of different measures of, of these nodes and how many neighbors they had, what types of neighbors they had, where they were situated in the network, et cetera, and build quantitative features or variables from uh, each of the nodes. So those are the predictor um, features that are going to be used. Okay, so basically then what we do is do a machine learning analysis, a random forest to predict um, nodes that are Alzheimer versus nodes that are not Alzheimer's. We, we did an 80-20 data split to with a holdout data set of 20% and threefold cross-validation to prevent overfitting. And then once we had a model of what makes a gene an Alzheimer gene based on its graph properties, then we looked at the PD genes, of which there were 76 from GWAS, and we said, okay, based on our model, which of these are predicted to have a link with Alzheimer's disease? 
So we did this uh, across 10 different random seeds, and here's the performance of the random forest. The accuracy here was about 95%, a little better than 95%. The balanced accuracy was better than 95%. The area under the ROC curve was better than 95%. So we were getting very good performance of our machine learning algorithm on the holdout data across 10 different random seeds. Um, and here are the genes that we found, and we looked at the number of times across the different 10 random seeds that they were found. There were, I think, seven or eight here that were found consistently across all 10 random seeds. And I'm just going to focus on one of these. All of them are interesting. And, and again, these are all PD genes for which there's no GWAS evidence that they're involved in Alzheimer's. Okay, I'm going to focus on this first one just to, as an example. So Finn, some of you might recognized as a tyro tyrosine kinase involved in cell growth. And again, this is uh, associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, here's the GWAS catalog for SNPs in this gene. And you can see the phenotypes that come up at the top are things like psoriasis, balding, type 2 diabetes. There's some eye phenotypes in here. And here's Parkinson's disease with a p-value of three times 10 to the negative eighth. Again, Alzheimer's disease does not show up in this table of GWAS results for, for the FIN gene. Now, what I didn't know, I wasn't familiar with this gene. Some of you probably are, but FIN actually, the FIN protein actually binds to tau, uh, and that's been known for more than 10 years now. Um, and also what I did not know before I started this is that there are labs actively developing small molecules to inhibit FIN as possible treatments of Alzheimer disease. So again, um, all we did here was look at the network structure for genes involved in AD versus not AD, developed a predictive model, and that predictive model identified FIN and some other PD genes as being connected with AD. And, and in the case of FIN, it actually is a biological candidate, a drug target for Alzheimer's disease. So the demonstration project, I thought, did nicely highlight the value of the knowledge base. But what I want to do and where we're headed in the next year or two with this grant, um, this U01 from the National Institute of Aging, is what I'm really interested in is how can we get Teapot, an automated machine learning algorithm, to automatically use the knowledge and the knowledge graph to guide feature selection, to guide model selection, to, and, and to, to automate the interpretation of these machine learning models. So this is going to be a big focus of my work moving forward. And if you're interested in automated machine learning, uh, we published this review paper in Human Genetics uh, earlier this year. And, and I think this is the first review of automated machine learning for the purpose of genetic and genomic analysis. And we talk about TPOD and some of the other methods that are out there and some of the few examples uh, in the literature. So let me thank uh, the TPOT development team. Randy Olson, of course, invented TPOT. Wei Shan Fu did a lot of the early programming. My current software engineering team, uh, Nick and Jay, have taken over the TPOT project and are pushing it forward. Pedro Ribeiro is a data scientist in my group who did the uh, benchmarking and is also developing some interesting new extensions for TPOT. Uh, Elizabeth Amanduki uh, did the, the GWAS analysis that I showed in coronary artery disease. Alice KB was developed by mostly by my postdoc, Joe Romano. The PDAD uh, demonstration project was done by Maitri, Brittany, and Paul, um, and kudos to them for uh, getting all this done in time for this presentation. This is the uh, NIA grant. Thank you to the NIA and to the consortium for, uh, for funding us and including us um, in this exciting network. My email, here's our GitHub for Teapot, and Al's KB is online and available for anybody that wants to use it. So I'll stop there and happy to entertain questions. This is um, the North Campus of Cedar sinai what's called the Pacific Design Center, where my lab is on, in the Green Building and where we're expanding um, uh, uh, genetic and genomic research labs through, through the built Blue Building. We're located in a beautiful area of West Hollywood in Los Angeles. Thank you very much.